Obviously, we want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I am humbled by your presence here today. Thank you. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and I have a lot to say about that, obviously. Your questions on trading. And if you don't mind, keep your questions related to the slides just so I can stay focused on the slides and my ADD doesn't kick in. If you know me, I tend to go off on tangents and rants, although some people tell me that's actually a good thing that I have. When I try to tell them directly, when I'm trying to tell them, they ask me, they tell me, geez, I really didn't get much out of that. But when you go off on a rant, we get it. Anyway, it looks like I'm going for a rant now. And if you don't mind, hold off. This is for your benefit until we get to the live charts for stock picks. And you can ask about as many as you want. We'll get to as many as we can. And if you don't mind also, this is for your benefit, by the way, ask about one ticker at a time. So what are we going to focus on this week? Well, learn to properly perceive and you will receive. And that's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. And then I want to touch upon simplified market timing. Where are we now? I want to look back at some of the things we talked about over prior weeks, but just really quickly because we spent so much time working on that already. But basically update where we are now. And then I also want to take a look at the shorter term charts because, as you know, patterns are fractal. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I like to sum it up, stealing a line from my buddy Greg Morris, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Learn to properly perceive and you will receive. Now, perceive as it applies to the markets, I like to poke around until I find the definition that I like the best as it applies to trading, obviously. And that would be to interpret or look on someone or something in a particular way. So I've asked this question quite a few times, but I think it dovetails nicely in with this presentation. How stressful was the 2016-2017 bear market in cocoa? Well, in case you didn't know it, cocoa got creamed back in 2016 to 2017. If you never traded commodities before, when a commodity nearly halves in value, especially considered, considering the leverage, that's a really big deal. And if this were the overall stock market, because a lot of people would probably be in the overall stock market, a lot of lives would be nearly ruined by such a big move. Now, so far, no one has told me that the cocoa market was stressful. I'm sure sooner or later I'll bump into somebody who was fighting this trend, and they'll tell me that they were pretty stressed out. Mark Douglas, the late and great Mark Douglas, once said, we are not perceiving the market, but only the unique market in our minds based on the distinctions we have learned up until this moment in time. Now. As I was rehearsing a little while ago, I actually stopped in the slide and thought about that. So when you're looking at a market and you're going to trade that market, you're trading that based on all your knowledge up until now. Now, as I'll kind of beat the dead horse on in a few minutes, somebody else may know something that you don't or more applicable may think they know something more than you know. And I often tell people, Trade at a small size if you're new to trading because you'll only be smarter in the future. And as you'll see in a few slides, and also, by the way, you're not as smart as you think you are now. So this market is in our head, and it's based on everything we've learned up to this moment in time. The market has no control over how you behave or respond to it. It's all in your head. Well, that cocoa market didn't really bother me. Didn't bother me at all, actually. In fact, I didn't know until after the fact that it was a bear market in cocoa in 2016, 2017. So that's the point. The market does not create fear. That fear is created within. It's your perception. So there's no fear in a market when you're not an active participant. And I suppose there is a little bit of FOMO, or could be a little FOMO, a little fear of missing out, especially if that market is trending higher without you. So one of the most brilliant things I think Douglas has ever said, 
And I quote Douglas so much. I think every time I say a quote from Douglas, I said, I preface it with one of the most brilliant things that Douglas says or had said is what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. When I am deer in the headlights in front of my screens, I think back to this quote. And then I need to figure out quickly what I need to do to act. Well, ideally, I have a plan in place that I'm going to beat that dead horse in just a few minutes. And I think it bears repeating. What you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do, what you need to do it without hesitation. As Mike Tyson once said in a very eloquent way, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Now, some people say this is attributed more to his trainer who said this, but who knows? Now, one thing I like to do is collect these old Wall Street books, and more importantly, read them. I tried collecting a few and selling a few, and I figured I better just stick to trading. If you're dealing with some sort of product like that, I don't know what you would call it, collectible, I guess. It, it's tough to make money. They're very expensive to acquire and very cheap to sell. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just amazed at the knowledge, this old knowledge that was back there. Everybody, obviously, everybody has read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator by Livermore, which I quote ad nauseum. But there's a lot more good books going way back in time. And this one's actually in public domain. I have a hard copy here. It's only like five bucks. If you see book to, books to read on my website, which I'll give you a link in a few minutes of that, you can get it. It's, it's literally, I think, $4.96 on Amazon. It's worth having a, a paper copy of RIM. But if you're really cheap, you can get a copy on the Internet since it is in public domain. It's been published so long ago. Anyway, there's a plethora of knowledge from this book, and I didn't realize how much I quoted it in this presentation until I started putting the presentation together from a couple of other presentations that I've been working on. And in this book, G.C. Selden says, one of the greatest difficulties encountered by the active trader is that of keeping his mind in a balanced and unprejudiced condition when he is heavily committed to either the long or short side of the market. Unconsciously to himself, he permits his judgment to be swayed by his hopes. And there's two big cognitive biases that cause that. And we'll get to those in just one second. So it's interesting that Selden was talking about the active trader. And the more active you are, I think the more dangerous it can become. I think the more, quoting Sukoda, the more you will have into wishing instead of intuition. And I'm as guilty as any. A lot of times I feel like, well, I'm Dave Landry, you know, kind of like I'm Brian Fellows. <laughs> and I feel like, well, I could, I could jump in for a little day trade to squeeze a little money out of this market that seems to be moving at the time, as opposed to following my well thought out, carefully planned plan. And as Selden pointed out, and Mike Tyson, etc., once you're an active participant, everything begins to change very quickly. Your psychology changes very quickly. It's hard not to be emotional. Robert Rotella, and if you look under books to read on my website, and again, I'll give you that link in one second, he wrote a book called Elements of the Successful Trader. I think that's right, or close to it, if not. And the book itself was okay, and I didn't really get a whole lot out of it. I've sort of already had my trend-following mantra in mind and how I wanted to do it and trade the pullbacks and the money management and all those other things. And I was already doing these type of things, I say in mind. I already was working on these things. But the psychology section of this book was really good, and I really, really enjoyed it. It really struck a chord with me. Now, I was I remember back then I was struggling a little bit with my trading, and I didn't know that we always will have a struggle in our trading, no matter how long you've been at this. It's the most humbling business in the world. And it reminds me of the Pressfield quote. The counterfeit innovator is wildly confident 
and the real one is scared to death. And that's one of these paradoxes is the longer you're in this business, the more you realize that you don't know and the more you realize that you don't have control over the markets. So unsuccessful traders believe that the market must act in the way they think. They are sorely mistaken. The mark, the better traders try to learn how the market thinks. So let me rewind that and add in a couple things too. As I said a second ago, the psychology section is really good. And I remember it striking a chord again because I was struggling at the time in my trading, probably going through a drawdown. And by the way, trend following is really losing money most of the time, if you think about it. You're going to be wrong most of the time as a trend follower. But anyway, long story endless, the point about the psychology section being good was because it was probably heartfelt because I later saw an interview with Rotella where he said that he was struggling in his trading when he wrote that book. And I think a lot of that comes out in the psychology section. So unsuccessful traders believe the market must act in the way they think. And they are sorely mistaken. The better traders try to learn how the market thinks. And I Googled him a while back, and this is where I got the picture. And looks like Mr. Rotella is doing fairly well. And again, I keep coming back to this Psychology of the Stock Market book, published probably 100 years ago or more. Few persons are so introspective as to be able to tell where this bias in favor of their own interest begins and where it leaves off. Still few bother to make an effort to tell. So we have a cognitive bias, and this is especially true once we're in an active position. Once we have, what's it all saying, a dog in the fight? Optimism then must consist in believing not that the tide will continually flow your way, but that you will succeed in floating with the tide. Sounds like trend following. Your optimism must be, in a sense, of the intellect, not of the will. You can't impose your will onto the market. If I could, you never would see my fat ass again. An optimism based on determination would, in this case, amount to stubbornness. So forcing your will into the market is being stubborn. And believe me, the market will quickly humble you if you try to be stubborn. So as I preach, I know I've said it a thousand times, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. The market is doing what the market is doing. Hard to accept. You may not want it to be doing what it's doing, and more often than not, you won't, but what is, is. So the price of the instrument, the ask, is the lowest amount that someone would sell it to you. And of course, the bid, the value of the instrument, the bid, is the lowest amount that someone will pay you for it. I have pay you for it. Sound like Modia here. <laughs> we'll pay you for it. So again, you might not like it, and the chances are statistically you won't. And I've done a lot of this these presentations where I talked about the fact that more often than not, you're in a state of regret. And I hinted that a minute ago. Trend following, you're going to be losing money most of the time. You're going to be underwater most of the time. Trend following is treading water in between big trends. Most people give up during that treading water phase. I have a really good dead money stock to show you. I didn't have time to get into the presentation, and I kind of don't want to jinx things, but I'll, I'll probably pull it up when we get to the charts and talk about that. But again, what is, is. Now, I kind of beat this book to death here. It's a really small book, <laughs> and the amount of quotes I've got out of it just for the one presentation, I'm pretty much giving you the whole book. The market is relentless. It cannot be budged by our sophistries. Now, I don't know if sophistries is an old-time word, but when I first read this a couple of years ago, it was new to me. And I kind of get into this flowerly, flowerly, if that's a word, flowerly language that a lot of these books used back then. And if you're like me, as soon as you find a word that's kind of interesting or different, you look it up. 
and I had never heard of a sophistry before, but it's a perfect word. The use of fallacious arguments, especially with the intention of deceiving. Well, we try to impose our sophistries, meaning that we try to impose our will upon the markets. So, starting from the beginning, the market is relentless. It cannot be budged by our sophistries. It will respond exactly to the forces and the personalities which are working upon it. As I often say, quoting Douglas, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And if you think about it, have you ever been in kind of a thin stock and you're trying to get out, but you don't want to pay that stupid wide ask? And then you put your order in somewhere in between the bid and the ask, and then you look at your screen, and lo and behold, that's you on the ask. So right there, even if you're just trading a few shares, you become part of the market, or you are part of the market. And that one little ask, maybe when their stock trades at that, could trigger something else, and it could have maybe a cascading type of effect. Now, it would have to be a really thin stock, but you kind of get the idea. And there's a lot more people out there obviously doing the same thing. So it will respond exactly to the forces and personalities which are working upon it with no more regard for our opinions than if we couldn't vote. We cannot work for our own interests as in other lines of business. We can only fit our interests to the facts. What is, is. To make the greatest success, it is necessary for the trader to forget entirely his own position in the market. We keep coming back to that. Once you're in an active position, that plan goes out the window because more than likely you're going to get punched in the face, at least a little bit. It is profits or losses, the relation of present prices to the point where he bought or sold. As I was reading this a little while ago, before we went live, what is he talking about there? Well, he's talking about sunk cost you have an anchoring and all of these other things that the behavioral psychologists and economists or whatever you want to call it behavioral science talk about for instance the endowment effect so the longer you own a stock the more you're going to become attached to it. And I don't know the exact experiments, but I know there's been a lot of endowment experiments done in the past. But I was just thinking right before we went live, let's say that, what's my next speaking engagement? San Francisco. So so I'm in San Francisco, and I'd be willing to bet if I did an experiment right before my speech where I said, hey, let's try something here. And so hold out your hand, and I put $100 in their hand. And then I say, now give it back. I would be willing to bet they would give it back immediately. But I'd also be willing to bet on the flip side, if I were to, hey, hold, you know, get here, let's try an experiment, put the $100 bill in their hand, easy for me to say. I do my little dog and pony, and provided it doesn't fall asleep when I finish my speech, if I asked for the $100 back, I'd be willing to bet that he would be a little hesitant, he or she, to give that $100 back because they have held on to it for a while, and then the endowment effect begins to kick in, even within an hour. And I'm sure behavioral psychologists have a lot better examples, but you get the point. To make the greatest success, it is necessary for the trader to forget entirely his own position in the market, his profits or losses, the relation of present prices to the point where he bought or sold. And again, that's another one of those things that comes from behavioral science. Anchoring, you have an anchor price in mind. Salesmen do this to you all the time. They they get a little anchor price in your head, and then they kind of work around that. And to fix his thoughts upon the position of the market, if the market is going down, the trader must sell. Now, obviously, my big caveat there is you just have to have a stop in place at a point where you will sell. You will have to give up open profits and more than likely, you will have some open losses before you are able to hit the initial profit target and trail that stop higher. And if everything works out perfectly, ride out that longer term trend. So you have to have a point where you're going to get out. And it's interesting. I put together all these slides. And right before I go live, I'm thinking, you know, you just have to know a point where you're going to be wrong and have a stop 
in place and provided you've done all the analysis going in and all the planning going in and you pick the best and leave the rest and all these other things I'm going to touch upon one more time towards the end of this presentation or again I should say at the end of this presentation then you just let that stop get hit to take you out of the trade or not get hit to keep you into the trade so throw all this psychology out the window and just follow the plan easier said than done that's why we're here and that's why we're talking about all these things if the market is going down the trader must sell of course if and only if it hits its stop no matter whether he has a profit or a loss now that's one thing that happens quite often is that we're in a stock and we take well doesn't happen I wish it happened more I wish it happened more often but let's say we do finally catch a decent trend and even if it just gets to the initial profit target and then stops out at a scratch or a small game that's better than the polk in the eye and I've had many a clients and I got angry last week as I said in the Facebook group because I stopped out of position at a profit why should I be angry at the market for stopping out at a profit so a lot of times you have to be willing to give up some open profits in order to capture a potential longer term trend and there's been times when I stopped out of my second loaf after holding positions for maybe a year or two and I think geez I really gave up a s ton of profits on that trade that really sucked and then a month later or two months later or a year later sometimes even years later that stock will come up in my scans and I'm like holy moly it tripled from where I got stopped out so it just reaffirms that that's part of the process giving up those open profits but a lot of times people get mad and send me a nasty email boy that really sucked Dave it's like well, wait a minute did you make money yeah and you're mad <laughs> Send it to me. As I said at nauseam years and years ago, I got screwed three quarters of a point on an option that was 29 points and the money. I got 29 points profit on the option position. I bought it at the money and I was bitching to another trader. He's like, let me get this right. You just made a boatload of money and you're complaining. I was like, well, it woke me up really quick. So if the market is going down, the trader must sell whether he bought a year ago or two minutes ago and that's where that endowment effect comes in and the more I read this the more I realize how much of this behavioral science which is a relatively new field has been around much longer than these behavioral scientists or these behavioral economic people would ever realize because a hundred years ago GC Seldon was talking about these things he can endeavor to hold himself in a detached un prejudiced frame of mind and study the psychology of the crowd especially as it manifests itself in the movement of prices that sounds a lot like technical analysis and not mumbo jumbo wave counting or some kind of arcane bar counting or something which might be right once every 30 years and everybody thinks you're a genius <laughs> but try to trade off of it what I'm referring to is as I define technical analysis reading the psychology of the market while at the same time embracing your own emotions or better put reading the emotions of the market while at the same time embracing your own so I throw in a little personal psychology into the market psychology there now your two biggest enemies when it comes to the market are perceptual distortion and his brother selective perception and these two kind of co-mingle and can get a little muddy as which one is which I'm working on a a project that I'm really excited about it's it's going to be something that I'm either going to give away or it's going to be really cheap and selective perception and perceptual distortion I think are going to be a big piece of that and that's what's really got me thinking about those two so with these two what happens is we see what we want to see and we perceive what we want to perceive now, Annie Duke, in her excellent book, Thinking in Bets, says, instead of altering our beliefs to fit new information, we do just the opposite. We alter our interpretation of that information to fit our beliefs. 
And if you go to www.davelander.com slash books dash to dash read, you can get a list of those books that I would recommend, everything mentioned in this presentation, including Annie Duke's book and people that I quote often, such as Greg Morris and others. So again, what it is is, if you're long, a series of down ticks might be perceived as a correction. Now, I probably should say, if you're long and you're wrong, if you're long and the market has already blown past your stop, which didn't exist in the market, but only in your mind, then you might see that series of down ticks as, well, maybe it's just still correcting. Well, maybe this market is becoming so oversold that it's due to bounce. Maybe I should not get out just yet. And the longer you stick with it, the more all these other little ugly things will raise their little ugly heads, such as endowment effect. And let's say if the market is in a serious downtrend and you're still long, then a series of upticks or possibly even one little uptick might be perceived as a reversal. That's the selective perception, which is closely related to his brother as perceptual distortion. They both sort of go hand in hand. Now, this is a quote that I will probably beat the dead horse on and keep beating the dead horse on because I think it's a fantastic quote. It sort of sums up all of this and more. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. I think I'm two F-bombs into today. Market's been open about an hour and five minutes. <laughs> now, I thought control related to a lot of what we're talking about. Like Selden said, you must not subordinate your will onto the market. So I picked up some of these slides on control, and I thought they would go nicely in with this presentation. And more importantly, it's lack thereof, something that you have to embrace and accept. Now, it's really paradoxical. A paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained, may prove to be well-founded or true. So the trader's paradox, the irony is that the more experience that you have, the more you realize how little control you have over the ultimate outcome. True, you will become better at picking the best markets and trading the best setups, but you will come to realize how little control you really have. Now, obviously, in any other profession, this would be just the opposite. The longer you're in that profession, the more experience you have and the more control you have over the situation. So again, we're kind of beating this dead horse on the psychology of stock market from Mr. G.C. Selden. But one thing that I thought was interesting is that the Socratic method applied to the average speculator would produce amusing results. Now, there's a Socratic paradox as it relates to the markets. I know that I know nothing. Now that's, some argue that's not Socrates, but it sounds like something that Socrates would say. I got a book on Socratic logic. I know you're probably thinking you want to party with me. And it's not an easy read. It's a textbook. So it's going to be something that obviously I can't sit down and read while my wife watches TV or something. I'm going to have to dedicate some time and and focus on the book and drink a lot of coffee when I do. But I do think that learning to think in a Socratic method, as Mr. Selden says, would produce amusing results. I'm not sure why I use the word amusing and not amazing, but my reading into that is that he means that you'd be amused at how great your results would be. Now, you've heard this before. Here's a quick little anecdote or a little story, I should say. Based on this, what does the other guy know? When you go into a trade, you obviously feel convicted, or you are 
convinced that this potential trade has the potential to work out really nicely. Now, someone's going to have to sell you that stock or the market if you're buying. So what does the other guy know? I had supper with my in-laws a few years ago. And we always, I don't know why, but we always end up in a heated debate on something. <laughs> oh, I'm dieting again. I guess I'm always dieting, so I'm off of beer. But I know as soon as they come over, I'm going to have to give myself a cheat day or something. Anyway, I digress. They don't watch this presentation, so I should be okay. But I try to avoid talking trading or anything like that. I try to just keep, keep it small talk. But we got on the subject of trading, investing, et cetera. And I said, well, now looks like a pretty good time for gold. Gold's trending higher, bottomed out. I don't remember exactly when it was, but if I could look at the charts, I could probably pinpoint the date. And my father-in-law says, why would they sell to you? What do you mean? Why would they sell to you? I was like, well, I'm trying to, I'm thinking in terms of like the market. And it's like, well, you know, the market maker or whoever. He might be scalping or whatever. And like, why would they sell it to you? And I think I come to the realization he was talking about the people on TV. And then, well, I tried to explain to him that that's not what I meant. Like, don't buy gold off TV. Because the reason they would sell it to you is they probably have a 20% markup. Well, he continued with his line of reasoning, which was just repeating over and over, why would they sell it to you? Well, why would they sell it to you? Even if they have a 20% markup, and it might not be that big, but some of these guys are really ripping off people. But even if there's a 20% markup, why would they sell it to you if it's so great? These commercials, gold is going to go higher and blah, blah, blah. It's the greatest thing in, in Great Town. Why would they sell it to you? So that's a good question. That's something that you should always contemplate when going into a trade. Now, a while back into the presentation, you can see this is a screen capture from YouTube because I couldn't find the graphic. But when you get into this business, what you think you know grows exponentially, and what you actually know grows exponentially, but what you actually know levels off quickly, and you actually might have to take a step or two back, or maybe more than a step or two back. And the dangerous thing that happens during that time is you know less or you're knowing less and less but what you think you know is growing exponentially and the market will eventually humble you to where what you think you know will eventually drop below what you actually know you'll start to feel like a dumbass now i didn't continue this chart forward but eventually what you actually know will have a gradual increase and then that might accelerate a little bit higher and that will merge with what you think you know to where you realize, obviously, you know that you don't know exactly what a market will do next. But you reach a point where you embrace this and what you think you know and you actually know merge together and then slowly climb over time and then will increase as time goes on. Now, I didn't know it at the time. So I drew this little graphic, did all this stuff. And then I later found out there's a name for all this. And it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I found this on the internet. And some of these, or this exact same graphic, I should say, they have Mount Stupid. The peak of Mount Stupid is right here. So you gain this incredible confidence going in. And as you gain experience, that confidence begins to wane. And then as you gain more and more experience and start reaching the expert levels, that what you know and the confidence begins to increase once again. So it's kind of like there's nothing new under the sun. I make these market discoveries and then find out someone 100 years ago talked about the same thing or some sort of psychology discovery when it comes to markets. And then this book that I just beat the dead horse on said a lot of the things that I'm thinking and feeling many, many years ago. So obviously when we trade, we step out from the known into the unknown. And obviously you want to do all your planning in the known phase and that is while the markets are closed and plan the best you can, pick the best, leave the rest, as we'll beat the dead horse on it even more in a few minutes. So when you step into the unknown, you're ready for the unknown. 
Now, you want to do, obviously, a careful analysis, but once that's done, you have to accept the outcome, good, bad, or indifferent. Once you enter the trade, you have to accept the fact that you have completely given up control. The only thing you now can control is you. Your protective stop is set at a distance based on statistics and not fear. Many times people, oh, I, I can't lose that much. I'm just going to risk a point. Well, the market's bouncing around the little hot biotech that you are trying to trade. It's bouncing around eight points a day. So your one point stop, I can all but guarantee it's going to get blown through and you can lose a lot more than one point. But let's say it doesn't get blown through, it just gets hit. I could almost all but guarantee it's going to get hit on noise alone. So you can't set a stop based on fear. It must be based on statistics. I've done complete presentations, especially in things like trading full circle, on how to set protective stops. So they must be set on statistics and not fear. And in combination of statistics, where you will be wrong as a trend follower. So they're going to take you out when you're definitely wrong and keep you in as long as you're right. As I said a few minutes ago, we're talking about all this psychology. But the reality is, if you're picking the best markets going in, your stop is going to tell you whether you should be in the position or out of the position and it will stop you from subordinating your will into the market and all these other negative things that I've touched upon. So with trading, especially trading psychology, a lot of times it just comes down to just do it. Just like I wrote the ultimate guide to determining market trends, which was uptrend page one and an up arrow, downtrend page two and a down arrow, and sideways page three, in a sideways arrow, the ultimate guide to trading would probably be only five or six more pages. Put in a stop. <laughs> Go about your life. Take partial profits. Try your stop higher. That's pretty much it. I know. Easier said than done. Another one of those great books, which I gave away. I got to stop beating myself up for that. I gave away thinking it was just I'd get another one. <laughs> I didn't know it was a rare book. But it's the viewpoints of a commodity trade is the name of the book. If you look at my Facebook group, I posted an interview that was done with Longstreet, and it's pretty good. I'd recommend you check that out. The deeper secret for the trader is his ability to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. So again, stop trying to control the market. Work to control you. Now, Mr. Longstreet's quote, which was, long before Larry Williams' quote, it's pretty much saying a lot of the same things. I just really glommed on to Williams' quote because it was just so eloquent and made so much sense. It pretty much wrapped it all up. But Longstreet said, the harder we try, the poorer the results. It is only when we operate in a relaxed manner that we rise to our best. Now, one thing that I thought about talking about this morning, the problem with all this trading psychology is you end up in this rabbit hole and so many things are interconnected, and you'll never, you'll never finish your presentation if you cover all in one or if you go off on all tangents. And one of those tangents is being flippant. And you, you have to figure out how to not care. And I know it's easier said than done. I just admitted that I dropped a couple of F-bombs already. So I know I've presented a lot of problems here, and I know I've threw in a few solutions. But to wrap it up, here's some things to think about. Now, it's cliche, but have you truly picked the best and left the rest when you're doing your analysis? This is before the trade. Have you exhausted all possibilities? Now, I mean two different things when I say that. I mean, have you gone through 2,000 stocks? Have you looked through the IPOs? Have you been building a momentum list day after day after day and going through those 100 or 200 stocks you have on the side in the momentum list? And once you do find a setup that you think is pretty good, have you looked at every other stock within the sector that's tradable, in other words, enough volume to trade, to make sure what you have is truly something that's worthwhile? And are you practicing primum non seri? And I thought that would be pronounced non churi, but anyway, close enough. <laughs> well, I'm a kunas, so I probably could pronounce it right anyway. 
And that's been known as the Doctor's Creed, and that's Latin for first, do no harm. So make sure you weigh the possibility of that perceived opportunity with the choice of not doing anything. You're not gonna lose anybody if you don't take a trade. So first, do no harm. And once you do all that, again, ask yourself, what does the other guy know? And of course, plan your trade. Where will you place your protective stop? And that's something that I've talked about quite a bit over the years. For years, I couldn't figure out why people wouldn't bother planning their trade. And then I went for a walk and it hit me. The moment you plan for a stop is the moment you plan that you could be wrong, the moment you accept that you could get wrong. So one way to wrap your head around this is to accept the loss going in. It's a cost of doing business. And if I'm risking 2%, I know that going into the trade, if I'm stopped out, I'm gonna lose 2%. Now I can't guarantee I won't drop an F-bomb going in, but I accept that loss going into the trade. And 2% is a number I've worked on over the years, and it seems to be about the right size. I've seen people say 5%. I think that's just ludicrous because at 5%, let's say you're, you're wrong, I don't know, five times in a row, that's 25%, six times, 30%. You get the idea. And you can get a pretty ugly streak of losing trades. So I think 2% is just about right. As I tell people, and some people when I'm telling this, they're like, thanks for telling me that. Now I feel more normal is that your position's always gonna to be too big when it's a losing position, and it's always gonna to be too small when it's a winning position. And that's just, it is what it is. I have an angry bird outside my window. <laughs> Go have no fun somewhere else. Now, one thing I've talked about for, before is mind sculpting. And there's a lot of neurology at, at work here. And without getting into all the neurology of it, if you can, just accept the fact that mentally rehearsing is a huge thing. You want to mentally rehearse right before you get in the trade. And then mentally rehearse what's going to happen during the trade. And then what's going to happen after the trade. Well, we're going to talk about during and after now. But the bottom line is you want to see yourself taking the setup if it triggers. And then see yourself not taking the setup if it doesn't. Now you're like, well, Dave, why wouldn't you take it? Why would you do that? Why would you just take the setup if it triggers? Well, a lot of people don't. A lot of people become deer in the headlights. Well, it triggered. Well, it's coming back in. Let me just wait a little while, see what happens. And then by the end of the day, if they had taken a position, it'll be at a loss. It's like, man, I sure am glad I didn't take that position. What happens the next day? Gaps higher 10 points. You'd be surprised. So, middle of rehearse, what are you going to do before, during, and after the trade? And one thing I've kind of stumbled upon recently. And it was through Scott Adams' book, which is in the latest now column and the, the column, the latest the now column before that, which you can get off my website, is affirmations. And I think this is going to be a whole presentation in and of itself, or maybe multiple presentations, is big affirmations are great. And I have some huge affirmations that I do every day now. But the small or much smaller affirmations are going to be the conduit that are gonna get me there. And that's the same thing with you too. It's the small affirmations are gonna be conduit that gets there. I will not take any unplanned trades today, okay? The big affirmation, I want X million dollars in Y years. Yeah, we all want that, right? And do those affirmations, but do the smaller affirmations to get you there. I will not take any unplanned trades today. I will not mentally monetize my profits today. I will honor my stop today, and so on and so forth. And again, without getting too far off track, imagine that, there's a physical change that takes place in your brain when you're doing mind sculpting, which is, I forget the guy's name who wrote the book. It's, it's again, on books to read. But when you're doing mind sculpting and affirmations and any type of learning type of behavior, there's actually a neurology that takes place inside of your brain. And if you look at the last now column, there's a little bit on that neurology, but just know that your brain actually changes and in a positive way, obviously. 
Now, during a trade, what you might want to do is put a passive order in to enter. I'll give you a case in point. I came in today, I saw a big gap, a big gap down in the stock that's mostly trending higher. And I thought to myself, I said, this thing is way overdone. I'm going to step in and make a little day trade on this. And I saw it immediately reversing around the open. And I said to myself, Dave, just sit back and relax a little bit. Because this is an unplanned trade because you don't know what the ogres are going to be until they happen. And then you actually have to work on the fly to trade. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the ogre, it's an open and gap reversal. If you go through the Q&A and if you go through the methodology on my website, these are SG type of trades. This, these are not our bread and butter, but sometimes we could pick up a little money here and there in between the big trend trades. So what I did was I placed, I wanted to just jump into the market. And even though it was at a spot where I thought it would be triggering or a good trigger, I said, let me just go another point or so above that entry and put in a stop order and then come back to working on my slides. Well, it nearly hit that stop order, but it did not trigger and reversed and so far it's down 10 points from that level and that just tells me right there if i'd have been emotional and just jumped in i would have been faced with a 10 point loss over about 15 20 minutes however by letting the market make a decision for me by putting in a hard stop entry order i avoided that trade doesn't always work okay but quite often it has saved my ass now Sometimes you want to put in a passive stop order, in other words, a hard stop, and go about your life. And if you are super duper disciplined, maybe use an alert. Now, when you're using alerts, you have to be very disciplined in that you will immediately act upon that alert. In other words, if it hits the stop, which isn't a hard stop in this particular case, but alert, you will exit that market and not become a deer in the headlights. When applicable, you want to place passive orders to take initial profit targets and trail stops. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. You might put in, I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but sometimes a limit order can be great for taking profits. This is especially true in a thin IPO. I'm kicking myself in the butt on a little IPO that I forgot to put in a limit order on and it spiked up on the open not today's open, it was a few weeks back, and I could have taken my initial profit target out of the trade. So, and that creates a lot of psychological stress and emotions and everything, all the other baggage that comes along with missing a profit target. But when applicable, place that passive order, that possible limit order, and then in some cases, if you're doing like an ogre trade, you might put in an actual trailing stop. In other words, you're not adjusting the trailing stop on your own. That is done automatically, whatever the amount, distance, or whatever you determine. And you might actually have an initial profit target based on that, too. And I've got some walkthroughs on that in the, in the members area on the Q&A, so check that out. You want to hope for the best, but fear the worst. Hope for the best, but fear the worst. I've done presentations where I talked about hope when you should fear and fear when you should hope. And I think that's the line of line of reasoning from Jesse Livermore. You must fear that your losses don't get any bigger and hope that your profits continue. And again, I did a whole presentation just on hope and fear, but a lot of times as human beings to do just the opposite. So you have to have that stop in place and fear that that loss won't get any bigger and that stop will take you out. So that's one way to overcome that fear is to place that stop. You can't hope that it comes back. I think that's the point I'm trying to get to. You must hope that your position keeps going higher, but fear that it won't and have a stop in place in case it doesn't. Commit to commitment devices to overcome equation. I think that dovetails nicely in with the micro affirmations. So I, Dave Landry, will walk away from my screen if there's nothing to do. When I get done with this presentation, I'm going to look at my screens and see what's happening. But I also know myself, so I have a friend coming over. I'm going to go exercise. We're going to ride some bikes, and that's going to keep me away from the market for a couple hours, and then I'll come back and do my nightly analysis. So if there's nothing to do that I haven't planned to do, at least, then I'm going to go about 
my way, or I will set some alerts and have my phone with me and trade if and only if my alerts go off. Now, I can't beat the dead horse on this enough. You have to do an honest post-mortem when you're done with the trade. I haven't, truth be told, plumbers have the worst pipes, right? I haven't done a whole lot of post-mortems lately. I've been a little lazy with that, but do the post-mortem. Go back to day one, back your chart out to day one, and ask yourself, is this the greatest looking setup in setup town? If the answer is yes, even if you lost money in your trade, then you did the right thing. And in that post-mortem, make sure, again, you pick the best and leave the rest. And it's in perfect hindsight, but you kind of have to try to forget about what happened in the market, in the news, whatever, and then make sure that you would take that setup if you were just seeing it today. And if you did, pat yourself on the back. If you say, what the hell was I thinking as I preach ad nauseum, that's okay. I still do that today on occasion, but I do it a lot less than I used to. And then, of course, did you follow the process? Those are the two biggest questions you have to ask yourself. Did you pick the best, leave the rest, and did you follow the process? You do both of those things, you're going to be fine longer term. Now, if you are super brave, and most people aren't, hold yourself accountable. As I've said quite a bit, client that does really well, then blows up a little bit, small accounts, or at least small for him, does really, really well, catches a bunch of big trends, takes my Landry list and prints money, then he starts over trading or day trading, does all these other things, and then he has since committed to some commitment devices, as I've said before, to fix those things, somewhat drastic ones. But anyway, as you said, would you be willing to put together a trading plan, explain it to your wife, and then trade that trading plan, and then show your wife what happened afterwards, but show her that A, you did plan the trade, and that B, you did follow the plan, and that C, outcomes are noisy, and maybe explain a little Terrence O'Dean to her, or Annie Duke, and all these other people. <laughs> anyway, again, as I've said quite often, he says, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So he knew deep down that he wasn't even holding himself accountable. And if he showed his training to his wife, that would be a disaster. All right, real quick, where are we now as far as the market time is, is concerned? I left a slide in from last week. Not a whole lot has changed on it. We'll take a look at the daily chart in just one second. This is a weekly chart. The green line is 10% away from the 50-week closing high. The red line is just simply a 50 day, I'm sorry, 50 week simple moving average. And the little blue up here illustrates how far away you are from that 50 week closing high. The system is long or bullish, if you want to look at it, as long as you're above the green line. In other words, as long as you're within 10% of the 50 week closing high. And you have two bars of upside daylight, meaning or upside Landry light, as I now call it, meaning that two weeks, the lows have been greater than the 50-week moving average. That's the entire system. I've beat this, beat the system to death over the last several weeks to months in the on my YouTube channel, so feel free to check it out there. Another simple market timing system is just use the Landry light in and of itself. If you're above the 50-week moving average, if the lows are above the 50-week moving average, I should say, it's green, as you see up here. These are the number of days you've been above that 50-week moving average. Stay long as long as it's above it, and then look to exit or possibly even short when it's below it. Your major bull markets, it'll be really green for a long, long time with very little red. Your major bear markets, it'll turn red and stay red for a long time. And sometimes in between, you'll have a little correction to where you really need to think long and hard about getting out of the market. Now, I've kind of talked about 2015, 2016 quite a bit, but that was one of those cases where, yes, you should have exited to get out of the market. Now, we talked about major weekly bow ties last week, and that's when you have a weekly bow tie coming off a major high. And a major high is, let's say, a 10 let's say an all-time high, and a major low would be, let's say, a 10-year low or 15-year low, whatever the case would be. But a significant, a very, very significant low, especially after you had a long extended bear market like we had in 2000, 
and 2008, which is actually, I call it 2008, 2007, because that's when the bear market really started back then. Anyway, those weekly bow ties could be really cool. Now, this is a live chart here. There's been some discussion in the Facebook group. And yes, we are now to a point where we have an hourly bow tie down. Remember, patterns are fractal. We just looked at some weekly charts. We're going to look at some daily charts in a minute. Well, here's an hourly chart. Got to be careful not to get sucked in too much because sometimes it could just be noise alone and not really a big, huge trend developing. But when you get an hourly bow tie down off of all time highs, sometimes it pays to pay attention because if that is the beginning of a new trend lower, it's going to start on that hourly chart first. And we'll take a look at that in just one second. So where's winter? It's funny. I go back into presentations and every time the market's a little iffy here and there, I pull out that bastard John Snow and start talking about winter. Winter is coming. <laughs> so far, it hasn't gotten here. And we don't know if it's coming just yet. Now, remember, the S&P 500 is long on the TFM 10% system and some other metrics, too, if you're looking at some of those other even more simplified techniques for following the trend. But it's interesting that the Rusty hasn't triggered a buy signal yet with the TFM 10% system. So it would have to be above this green line, which is 10% below the 50 week closing high. And it has to have two, two lows greater than the 50 week moving average. And so far that hasn't happened. And by the way, the last signal we had here back in September, the market dropped 18%. Now, 18%, that's, to me, that's a diaper change moment. That's a big drop. And once a market drops 18% that fast, as a trend follower, I have to wonder, is it going to become something much bigger? In this case, it turned right back around. But I think anyone who held through that and reasoned that they should hold through that, even though they look like a genius today, eventually won't look so smart. So, again, we have no Landry light just yet. If you're a member of DaveLander.com, which quite a few of you are, but haven't, join the Facebook group. Please join the Facebook group. I will prove you right away. And also, when you go to join, it's going to ask you what email you use to sign up. So please let me know the exact email you use to sign up for the website so I can get you in there. And that's just to keep the riffraff out. And that's right on top of the members area. And if you're not a member, I'd encourage you to become a member. I have a lot of happy members so far, and we've been doing really well for the most part of the Facebook group, although there hasn't been a whole lot of opportunities yet. I'm sorry, not yet. Well, that's not a Freudian slip. There's been quite a few opportunities. There hasn't been a whole lot of opportunities lately, but we have found quite a few things so far there, and I've been having a lot of fun, as some of you have, at least that's what you're telling me in the group, so really been enjoying that, a lot of fun. All right, let's, let me shift gears here, and then we'll, uh, let's go ahead and open it up into, hello, Devin. We'll open it up for individual questions. I mean, individual stock picks. Just want to show you a couple things real quick with the market. Let's start with the P's. Like I said a second ago, if we take a look at a or an hourly bow tie down, you'll see that we have an hourly bow tie down, and that would have triggered, I guess, right in here somewhere. Let's take a look at the spiders since you could actually trade the spiders. Now, I'm not saying rush out and short. I mean, you are, you never forget when you take something like an hourly bow tie, you're fighting a longer term trend. I would rather trade on the side of a longer term trend, but I just want to throw it out because I know some of you guys are watching this, and sometimes this could be a bit of a heads up like, well, maybe everything isn't fantastic in the world. So, getting back to the daily chart, as you can see, so far we just got to pull it back in here. My big concern is when you don't clear the prior peaks, and I know I've been saying this quite a bit, but when you don't clear the prior peaks decisively, a few ugly down days could put you back into this sideways suit. The S&P, as you see, let's go back to the actual S&P cash, but the S&P cash really hasn't cleared that peak that decisively However, it looks a little bit better than the NASDAQ, which just kind of barely got above the prior peaks. And then today, 
it is now oh good we're getting some as we speak we're getting some requests to join a facebook group as long as you're a member i will approve you as soon as the webinar is over be happy to but as you can see the nasdaq's already pulled back into this wide and loose range not the end of the world let's not get too excited just yet but you know me, I sure like to see new highs and have the market not look back for a while before it begins to pull back. The Rusty remains a disappointment. It's up a little today, but you got to be careful not to chase your tail here. As you can see, it's just kind of bumping along in this little sideways range. Longer term, as I've been saying quite a bit, still looks like a big picture retrace rally. Until and unless it bangs out brand new highs, I wouldn't get too excited about the long side here, or at the least, it needs to get past this prior little peak in here. The sector action, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on sectors, but it is a little mixed here and there. You got some areas like silver, as you can see, doing really, really well in here. Some other areas like the transports tried to break out a couple days ago, came right back in. Semiconductors, still, I wouldn't call myself bearish on these, but I'm still a little concerned that they haven't made the brand new highs yet. I sure like seeing them bang out some new highs. And then everything else is kind of mixed. Some areas are banging on new highs. Some areas are a little questionable. For instance, drugs, you can see they didn't get past their prior highs in here, and they've already come back in. All right. I think that's all I had. Let me just show you a, 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 the dead money report I want to talk about. And then while I'm doing this, if you have any individual stock picks, let me know. So here's a stock we heard back here. And what happened? It went absolutely sideways. So what do we do? Nothing. We stuck with the position. Now, from what I can tell, the group of people I have now on the service have gotten a lot better, or I should say, or a lot smarter bunch because they've been through this enough times and know that sometimes things just don't take off. And you put that stop in there, stop us here somewhere, whatever, and just go about your life. Go and try to find another setup. But you can see one, two, three, four, five. Let's see, May, June, July. Round numbers. That's um, let's say about five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, where you were barely making money or even underwater on the trade, and then it finally took off. Well, it didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, it went sideways, and you're a trend. But Dave, you're a trend trader. Don't you want it to go up? Yeah, of course I want it to go up. But sometimes the market has its own time frame. Again, what did I just preach about for an hour? and change, you can't subordinate your will to the market. And all you have to do, and I know easier said than done, I'm sure I dropped some F-bombs along the way with this one, more than I care to admit, but all you have to do is put that stop in place and go about your life, and then of course, take those partial profits when it rallies up, which I think was on this day here, get that stop to break even, and then trail loosely. But this is not dead money, okay? Dead money, if you go to, I guess, investopedia.com is paraphrasing, is a position that has no potential for any further gain. Well, if I knew this stock would not go up, then obviously I would get out. But you don't know that. If you knew that, you'd own the world, by the way. So a lot of times you got to back out some of these things and think about it. It's like, well, wait a minute. If I knew the stock would never go up, if you knew that every stock you were in, when it became dead money, became was actually dead money, then you'd own the world because you would get out of every stock that would never work out and you'd stay with everyone that would. Unfortunately, Beatrice, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works, okay? All right, idiot stock picks. Got a quiet bunch today. Going once, here we go. One second, <laughs> somebody's typing. Type quickly, dish. Okay. Well, one thing that I'm seeing here is it barely got past this prior little peak. And the other thing, of course, is it's a huge stock, okay? So let's back to chart way out. It's just going to have a lot of trading to overcome. I wouldn't say a tremendous amount of overhead supply, but quite a bit. And HV is about 30 which isn't super duper low. I mean, this stock can actually move, but I would try to find something not necessarily super thin, but something a little thinner 
that has more potential to move. Okay. So I'm passing that. And oh, by the way, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of stocks I like right now because there's not a whole lot of stuff that's set up. Okay, CUTR, you see you've got this big old fat gap we're getting ready to push into. Well, markets have long memories, okay? So anybody who got caught in that gap is now looking to get whole, okay? Anybody who bargain hunted back here is looking to get whole. What is technical analysis? Reading the emotions of the market while at the same time embracing your own. And that's a complete presentation in and of itself. Also, look at how thin this stock is. It's pretty thin. It's only traded by what 18,000 shares so far today. So I would pass on it just based on this. I'm not even analyze what's going on here. There's no need. Okay, E N T H. Oh, E H T H. Okay, now this one, I'm getting a lot of questions on the price for perfection, and I'm going to have to flesh that out a little further. But this is an insurance broker, and I don't see it's off screen somewhere. Where did it go? Let's see if I can find it. Oh, there it is. It's had an incredible run in here. Now, I often say price for perfection. Once a stock gets this high and has this much of a run, especially if it's if they're not splitting the atom, okay, then you have to wonder if it's ran its course. So that's the first thing I would see there. And maybe try to find something at a lower level. Now I'm gonna talk out of both sides of my mouth. The stock is never too high to buy or never too low to sell. But ideally you want to short stocks that are coming up at higher levels and you want to get long stocks before they've had tremendous run-ups. Now, they might be a pretty serious run-up, but if it's been in a trend for years and it's up 500%, especially if they're not splitting the atom, and especially, now in this case, it's not that thick, but especially if it becomes a really, really thick stock, then there's so many analysts that are covering the stock and so many people are on the wrong side of the trend, or I should say are, are on one side of the trend, and, if, and I, I don't know if this is the correct term or not to use, but it's a crowded trade, so to speak, okay? So I would say yes, maybe on more pullback, but I would also try to find something that's in more of a developing trend. It could be a trend knockout or a pullback or something like that, but just something that's in more of a developing trend as opposed to that. Now, this one looks interesting, and I was hoping this would be a good example of a more developing trend. But you have a mountain of overhead supply to deal with. It depends on how you want to measure it to here or to here. So I would immediately pass on that one, throw it out. That next one you're gonna that's that's that next one you're asking about is the one that I was gonna use, but I'm gonna save it for next week's QA because it's on the Landry list for today. So I can't sorry about that. I can't talk about that one. But yeah, good eye on that one. The WK, this is another stock looks like it's priced for, for perfection. Easy for me to say. It's ran from here all the way to here. That's a pretty big run. And let's zoom in a little bit and see what it looks like. And the other thing is it's just kind of grinding along in here. Notice that back here, it sort of shot higher and then now it's kind of grinding along. You want to see just the opposite. You want to see a stock do that. And do this. So it looks to me like it's losing momentum. V C T R. On a net net basis, it's kind of going sideways here. So you want to see it break out. Also, super duper thin, too thin. So I toss that one out. A R D. You know, again, you're gonna have to look at this overhead supply. You're gonna have to look at look how thin. Okay, too thin overhead supply. CPTA, we need to get you in a stock selection course. That You have some really good picks, but a couple of them need a little work. It's okay, room for improvement. Uh, again, you know, going back to that stock we saw recently, 
a big gap down, so a lot of bad memories in the stock. And also a little bit on the thin side. I mean, the, the how how thick a stock is is a little tricky because if it's too thin, then it's it's hard to trade. We call those as uh, I think it was John in the Facebook group calls them Hotel California stocks, bastardizing the line from the song. You could check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. So a little bit of a problem with that one because one, it's thin, and two, it has bad memories. So pass on that. Okay, any more? Well, while we're on impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. We're almost out of time anyway. I appreciate you, again, taking time in busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, you can go to submit them at www.davelander.com slash contact. And I will either A, cover them in an upcoming week in charts, if they require a lot of thought, I will cover them, cover them in the Q&A section, and I'll give you some information on how to get a trial to the members area, or I'll just get you set up for that. There's a way to do it automatically, and I don't have to show you. And that way, you'll be able to watch my answer. Quite a few of you have done that and thank me for it, and you're welcome. I'm happy to do it. All right, everybody enjoy your weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Thank you so much.